New Mexico, the Republic thereof, one day closer to victory here in the occupied lands. This is brought to you by the Little Brother Information Network. Big Brother is watching and Little Brother has a big mouth. It's our own little private joke because he was to say about three or four years ago a lot of people had no idea what was going on. It's not that the information wasn't there, it just wasn't being put out because it was it required a great deal of work to dig. In many cases the information was to a certain extent classified. We took one basic rule that many old gentlemen have explained to me, follow the money, you'll find the problem. That's exactly what we did. Now it's 1994. As you see in the distance, the storm is on the horizon. Well, I want to take you back a few days, a few years ago. It was mid-morning like this. Family was sitting in their home, pretty remote. Husband, wife, children, family, friends. The dogs began to bark. So the kids grabbed their hunting weapons, the son and the father. They followed the family dogs, who were well adept, very intelligent, they're trained, into the woods. As the dogs reached a small thicket, a combat-clad, camouflaged individual jumped out, shot the dog, and they turned and fired on the family. You and I both know that any of your family pets are the same as family relative. And so the son responded as the dog was fired upon, and as he returned fire, he was hit first in the arm, and as he turned to, to flee, he was shot in the back and fell to the ground. Before the dust had even settled, of course, the other side had fallen back to a certain extent. The family friend, of course, returned home and informed his father that his son was dead, and they recovered the body. The child was laying in a, basically a calving shed, while the father went out to check on the body that evening, again, it being very remote, as he raised his arm, he felt a tug at his shoulder. The round crashed through, creating a catastrophic wound, and he turned with his, with his uh, best friend to return to the house. And as the wife was holding her baby in her arms and trying to call the men in, and as they passed through the through and into the house, another rifle round crashed through her face. She fell to the ground screaming, which is not usually talked about within our circles, but it's important to understand she didn't die right away. It was not a merciful wound. As she fell to her knees screaming, the bullet that passed through her and the spall from her head, in other words, her skull, passed into the family friend's chest, creating a catastrophic chest wound, sucking chest wound. They fell to the ground. Most of the, of the adult family members were either severely or injured to some extent, along with the children. They closed the doors and the, re the siege of Ruby Creek began. Was this Nazi Germany in 1933, 1935, 1939? Was this Bolshevik Russia, harvest of sorrows of the Ukraine? No. This was the United States of America in the 1990s. Well, 11 days approximately later, that siege ended with the loss of life grade a family destroyed, and the American people, to a certain extent, knew exactly what happened and did nothing. Some friends responded. Your enemy, the New World Order, saw that this was quite successful, considering the cost. And so, a time later, families gathered together in their own church, on their own property, in their own home, private, could hear the rumble of cattle cars as they pulled up outside and a bunch of black-clad, jack-booted stormtroopers with coal scuttles and ski masks assaulted the house and the church and proceeded to destroy that congregation. In the initial attack, grandfathers were killed, children, mothers, grandmothers. As this siege was generated late forth, we watched it on national television for 51 days. And we should all be ashamed of the fact that we did absolutely nothing. Was this Nazi Germany when they burned the place to the ground and allowed for very few, if any, survivors, or I'm sure purely by accident? 
Was this Russia in, 1940, in 1935 with the Harvest of Sorrows or with any of the other purges of Stalin? It was not. It was the United States of America in the 1990s. It is not fiction. It is not an illusion. It is reality. And trust me when I say this, ladies and gentlemen, that you have already seen two escalating incidences. And in each case, your enemy has fine-tuned the machine. Each time they've done a better job of controlling the press, haven't they? Each time they've silenced, the vo silenced any voices of opposition. Where is the quote-unquote American media? Let me parallel something for you, which is a thorn in the side of many, many American veterans, especially Vietnam veterans. And it's something I know we don't want to be reminded of, but it's an incident that happened during the Vietnam War called My Lai. We were at war, and this was a free fire zone, but still, a similar situation took place, and under combat conditions, even though this was a war, the federal government of the United States made a point of hunting down the officers involved, bringing them before courts martial, prosecuting and sending to jail the individuals responsible. Let me ask you something. Has a single man involved in the Ruby Creek slaughter or in the butchery at Waco been brought for trial? No. No. Isn't it strange that in time of war we make the effort to punish our veterans for what are probably crimes? In the same breath, with the secret police of the United States, we let them walk free on these streets, and you don't even know if they're amongst you right now? Doesn't that make you wonder about the priorities of the people who are in charge? Of course, they're the people who are ending and raving during the Vietnam War, too. Make no mistake about it. They're now the ones with, who, are, who are in charge of the butchery. Well, it is inevitable that we are going to face these people on the field of battle. I know many people don't like to hear that, but in reality, we are going to try everything we can peaceably to come up with a solution, and we will not find one. But what we will do is force our aggressor to peel away his mask and show you what he really is. You've already seen it. There were men, women, and children, old men, grandfathers, grandmothers, and what they did at Waco was use a thing that was forced in the forced entry, the type that you're using, a tactical entry, which is becoming very popular, and many of your local law enforcement agencies are being trained in it, dynamic entry, in which they come into a home and they shoot everybody. They are trained to engage and destroy all targets. Now, if you want information on that, strangely enough, some articles on dynamic entry have actually been covered in your national magazines, specifically in law enforcement magazines, so we can find copies of this. And he describes going in forcibly with arms correctly, or arms available, engaging targets, shooting anybody that he is even suspected of being a threat, identifying the casualties and killed, collecting all intelligence data, picking up their own wounded, and leaving that quickly, in and out. This is a fine tuning of their failure at Waco to try and bring in more bodies and more manpower because they realize that the best they had to train. By the way, that was an ATF shock unit, or another we call an ATF assault unit. That particular unit was pumped up prior to the action, and in reality got their butt kicked. The only problem is this, and I think all of you have the same attitude, and you better, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to unlearn it, is that when you're in a fight like this, you must fight to win. They had defeated the enemy on the Battle of Waco on the very first day. Any time that an aggressor leaves a site and routes, leaving his wounded and his dead on the ground, that's called a rout. That's not retreat. Frank, wait, oh, get off my boot as they leave. Okay? When you see men standing dazed and in shock, and they're the ones who supposedly were the ruffians, and, and of course, supposedly they're going to be the victors on the battlefield, when they faced limited opposition, because these people were on their power base and still didn't use everything they had. When the ATF had run out of ammo, by the way, something they won't admit to, but how much ammunition can you carry when, as you've seen in the videos, you're You can't do that forever, ladies and gentlemen. Eventually, the shock action wore off, and it came down to an eye-to-eye -eye conflict, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, between American citizens and a secret police force. We don't take too kindly to black shirts, do we? In 1975 and 77 and 78, I was trained to shoot at ski masks. The terrorists were wearing them. Well, now the terrorists are still wearing them, but now they're employed by the government.
that's sad but true. But unfortunately, uh, you have to look at perspective as to why they went to the black uniform in the first place. We're going to cover a lot of things here, but I want to get this point across. Black, symbolically with our culture, is the color of death. It is the color of terror. Why black helicopters? Why black cars? Why black vans? And why standardize on a black uniform? A lot of your local law enforcement officers may have already received their special issue if they're involved with the MJTF police, multi-jurisdictional task force. Now, the MJTF we've known about for four going on five years. We demonstrated it. And yet we had tremendous opposition, especially from individuals in government who were in denial. Obviously, there was a reason for this. They were building up a, and now you hear it on every, on every media channel, national police force. Most people here, I, I, I'm sure, would say, I'll never see that in my lifetime. Maybe my sons and daughters, but not my lifetime. It's in every paper in the country. You've all seen it on the national news networks. So it's not our words anymore, it's theirs. What kind of nations have national police forces, comrade? Yes. The Geheimstaatspolizei, the Gestapo, were a national police force. The KGB is a national police force. Oh, that's right. We're bringing them to the United States, aren't we? Oh, congratulations. Your FBI is going to be standing side by side with some of the worst butchers we've seen on this planet in a, in a century. Don't you all feel, feel proud about that idea? And we get to have an office in Moscow, too. Oh, gee, so they can train us a little better at what, what they do best? Well, the black uniform is part of that. Why the ski mask? Why the black coal scuttle helmet? The connotations, the images, and the, re the reflection here of times past. All this scene when they enter are the eyes in a black field. And what are the eyes? Windows to the soul. If you are dealing with hatred and with a terrorist, what will you see in those eyes? Thank you. Yeah. And that is their objective. Terror. The other side doesn't know any better. Really, it's all that they do know. They are not of the, of the American cut. I say that uncategorically. They are certainly internationalists. Make no mistake about that. And I might remind you that from that internationalist vein, that uh, there are a lot of other countries that used black as a uniform, didn't they? The Gestapo and the, and the SS, of course, were one. Everybody always remembers that because Hollywood rubs it in. But let me ask you something. Before the SS was ever there, and long after the SS were, were buried in Berlin and under the rubble of World War II, the KGB's standard dress uniform and their field uniform has always been and will always be black. It is no accident that they've chosen the color that they have for just as with the harvest of sorrows and just as with the many dozens of purges in Russia, which were very, very, very successful, by the way. Anywhere from a low estimate of 30 million to a high estimate of 70 million. That black uniform was the image of terror that was seen on the streets during the day. And of course, at 3 o'clock in the morning, we would knock at the door. That's what you're facing. And yes, there'll be some warm fuzzies in between to make you all feel good to try and surrender your sovereignty and to try and convince you that you need to hand over the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The organizations that originally were being formatted do not come from the Carter or the Clinton administration. Carter and Clinton, same difference. Sorry. I do that all the time now. But initiated with George Bush's administration, and in fact, much of this, for those of you who are more experienced, know this goes much deeper into our history. But in most recent years, knowing full well that they were close to the victory, close to putting their ring through the fi their, their finger through the golden ring while they were going around on the merry-go-round, being able to take that final prize, it's the MJTF police that was first formulated to become the national police force. The multi-jurisdictional task force motto is. They are the velvet glove on the iron fist. The iron fist is also a symbol of the KGB. This model was made by them, not made up by us. And in fact, some of you might remember the governor of Colorado when he discussed confiscation of firearms. What did he say? 
He was going to rule with an iron fist. Ronald Reagan mentioned this while he was in Europe, ruling with a steel fist. We've heard time and again references to the iron fist throughout the political system. Now, in intelligence, we have a rule about this. You hear it once, eh, not important, you just can make a note of it, mental. You hear it twice, oh, that could be coincidence. When you hear it two, three, four, five times, or a dozen times, and it's from several different tiers, you have the demonstration of a specific dogma that's being taught. It means that these people are part of a group that is getting a particular conditioning or teaching, ladies and gentlemen. And it helps to show you the combinations and infrastructure that's involved that you're facing. Now, these people are not all powerful, but they do know that most of it has to do with pulling the wool over your eyes. The MJTF police was authorized first in 1989 and was able to literally cross all borders and boundaries. Your county sheriff is supposed to be the highest authority of the land, by the way. Well, many, not all, but many, several, of course, in larger communities, I'm not sure about Albuquerque, have, in fact, sold themselves out to, purely for the sake of additional financing, through the MJTF police, which then allows federal agencies to come in and take over. You know the alphabet soup, ATF, FBI, DEA, DEA, uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and many others in between. But all these agencies needed a coordinator. The MJTF police were the lowest boot literally the black boot of the overall structure. Many of you have heard about street gangs being incorporated. We did the original research on it. The most recent piece that I have, if you ask where we can get copies of this, uh, came from the conference in Chicago, the Inter-Gang Conference, which lasted seven days, and discussed how best to integrate the street gangs into law enforcement mechanisms across the country. And they're talking about this as if it were a later stage process. They have the basic cadres, they have their NCOs and officers, and they're ready to go. Now, the first thing somebody's going to ask is, why would they pick the street gangs? Well, I don't understand this. That doesn't make any sense. Let me explain to you why. The street gang situation was allowed to flourish, and we can also demonstrate this, because a series of operations that were already in place, most of them were state-sponsored throughout the nation, were designed to put a check on the possibility of street gang development accelerating the way that it had. But if you are looking for brown shirts, or in other words, thugs, and you need cannon fodder, the street gangs are an ideal situation. First of all, you have pariahs. Now, people are always looking for personal justification. By allowing the street gangs first to exist, and then having the federal government come in and say, you know, we can do something with you, well, there aren't too many people who wouldn't pass up that opportunity. But what else did the street gangs do before they ever got there? Number one. Regimentation. The pecking order was already in place and they're already in military type formations. Two, because of the pecking order, the strong come to the top. Those that are natural leaders and very aggressive become the management of the street gangs. Now that's your senior NCOs or your NCOs, your officers, ladies and gentlemen. And all that's needed then is with a little prompting and coaching for an agency to come in from the outside, generate the command structure, and also tell them this, oh, drive-by shootings? You'll be doing that for the government from now on. Out of the back of a military truck. Uh, breaking and entering? Now you'll be able to, instead of going through the front door and having to worry about a time limit, the only time limit they're going to worry about is the fact that they can't grab the booty fast enough to get out to the trucks before they get to the next house and the other gangs there. Search and seizure laws allow for that, remember? 1-800-SPY laws, 1-800-ATF-GUNS. Now, I, every time I pass a payphone, I try to test that number because I feel a little shaky every once in a while, and I like to know that the ATF is there. <laughs> it's just that my way of knowing that those patriotic thugs, I mean butchered, I mean, well, you know, are busy doing their job, right. And what do they do? Well, when you dial that 1-800 number, then, of course, the person who calls gets a percentage of the pie. Now, in China, we call them, uh, they call this the grandmother network, in which the grandmothers go from house to house and spy, and for a little extra spying here and a little extra spying there, they get a little extra rice, or they get a little extra benefit, like a can opener. And I can tell you a story about that on the side of the subreddit. Or little things that they just can't get in the regular common market where the rest of the peasants are. 
In Russia, the Informa network worked exactly the same way. And people tell me, we'll never see that in this country. It's right in front of you on national television. You need to only watch the cop shows and everything else is generated to make you feel that there is, it is futile to resist. You shall be absorbed. Kind of like Star Trek, the yuppie generation. Okay, with the Borg, remember? It is futile to resist. You will be absorbed. Well, sadly enough, the MJTF is not the only mechanism. It will incorporate your local law enforcement, sheriff's department, many of your federal agencies which will come down to help coordinate. It will be done away with. And in fact, as you may have already heard, or as I, as I mentioned earlier, of course, the National Police Force is the next step. The National Police Force will also perish. And eventually what will happen is you will see the United Nations Security Forces in full flower, berets, helmets, and baseball caps complete, and we will lose our sovereignty and we will lose the first line of defense that we have, that long blue line, our law enforcement because we lost control of it at the local end. And you better thank God right now they're still here for the moment. There's going to come a time when you'll have no say in the management, the procurement, or the control of these people. We're already on the edge of losing it right now. Well, the MJTF wasn't the only, or the National Police weren't the only organizations. They had to have a coordinating agency. And this one is very entertaining because when originally we did the research on it, people absolutely positively denied that there's no way they could have something like this. FinCEN. F-I-N-C-E-N, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Sounds innocu innocuous? Oh, they're paper pushers. Yes, some of them are. But by looking at the budget, because we couldn't get information on the organization, we have a good idea of how many thousands of men and tens of thousands of men are on the payroll. Go to the national budget. You can find FinCEN listed every year, and you'll also have progressive payroll tables going back quite a ways. Well, FinCEN will, in my opinion, become the Gestapo of the United States. Most people don't understand the Gestapo, by the way. Everybody seems to think that it was just popped up out of nowhere and was the national secret police force inside the SS. It was not. Originally, the Gestapo was nothing more, what was known as the Geheimstaatspolizei, was nothing more than a local suburban police department. But they were in the right place at the right time, and they came to power by doing what? by collecting data on every citizen in their community, then in their area, then in the region, and then in all of Germany. Well, FinCEN's mission is exactly like that. Through a series of mainframe supercomputers that they purchased approximately five and six years ago, setting the system up, and using the software that came from the Inslaw case, which allows for interfacing with virtually any type of computer that exists that's in the system right now, they can collect data on virtually any person in this room within a six to eight minute time, virtually everything. Your financial records, your automobile licenses, all of your firearms registration, virtually everything. But not just on you, because of a change in the Copper Wire Act with regard to wiretapping, etc., and the collection of electronic data and information, they can also collect information on every person around you, one house to the front, to the back, all of your neighbors and run the same data check on all of them without any of them ever knowing that it happened. Now I picture this because because of these changes in the laws, FinCEN does not have to release or download any data that's collected. It doesn't get rid of it. So it's like a big water balloon and we're all in it. All of our data, all of our private information is sitting in this balloon. What they've done is they've simply taken a pin and they put a tray underneath the balloon, poke it, and they can be patient. Within a period of time, Everything that's in the balloon eventually will be in the tray. And so, as it would happen in the past, they will collect everything that is necessary. And again, we are on the very edge of catastrophe with this. They have some, but they don't have all. They are not all seeing it, but they're trying very hard. Well, FinCEN isn't the final solution. In fact, uh, Al Gore, you know, it's like Igor, Al Gore, okay? Al Gore. Now, mind you, I don't mind trees, but tree hugging isn't my thing, okay, the way he does probably. Well, anyway, uh, Al Gore, of course, in the first six months to a year of his mission as vice president, was pretty well out of the picture, you recall. He was given very little of any publicity. In fact, he was pretty well, for the most part, in the background. You never saw him with Clinton for the, for the uh, first one, one and a half years, roughly. When he did come out this last fall, he finished a project which had taken most of his time to create, and some of you may never heard of this, the Directorate of Central Law Enforcement. 
information is overtly available. I've seen no media coverage where they've picked up the ball and run to find out what the director of central law enforcement is about. It will create the final solution on their part for a national secret police force incorporating CIA, DIA, FBI, ATF, and all of them under one umbrella. All of these agencies will be under one mechanism, period. That means a lot of bureaucrats are going to lose their jobs too, because remember, they like to thin things down and trim the lines out. And they also don't like competition in secret police mechanisms, which means eventually they've got to get rid of a lot of people who have seen too much. And they can't let them live. So there's one good thing, as we always say, one of our mottos, they eat their young. So in, one, in some ways, they'll do some of our work for us when the time comes. Well, if you thought that was bad enough, then of course the next tier, and the logical one, which now again you are all hearing publicly on national radio, national television, our United Nations peacekeeping force. Peace. Peace, Mowgli. Yes, peace. Like the snake. In Jungle Book, Mowgli was only wanted for lunch, as we all know, and we don't mean to sit down and have some. They meant be lunch. Well, again, we got lots of warm fuzzies flying in all directions, but any of you who are familiar with the United Nations Charter knows that it is a total reversal of what our Constitution and Bill of Rights stands for. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that the United Nations can offer you that you do not already have as a sovereign in this nation, as a citizen. That flag standing next to us, by the way, is a representation of you, not the government. It's a representation of something that should be cherished by all of you and you'd best hang on to and fight to the death for, and that's the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. No matter what. A gentleman, and we weren't, we're not deriding the people who work here, but a gentleman was going to bring forward a nicer flag than we had here. But many of you may have noticed it had a little strange thing around the outside, that gold fringe. The gold fringe determines that a different authority would be placed in this room. Admiralty law, British maritime law, statute law. I am a constitutionalist. I will not bear that flag to be with me. And I would retire that flag if I had to and have done so in the past and ask that anybody bring forward a national American flag. Now, if you don't think symbolism is important, then I suggest you go to many courtrooms today and offer them a very nice, brand new, well-embroidered, regular American flag without the gold fringe. The court will not accept it. So if you don't think symbolism is important, you better take a look at the other side. They feel symbolism is important. It shows where they put their foot. The constitutional flag represents just that, your constitution. Your constitution. Remember when they passed the law said you could burn it? That judge walked back to his quarters and laughed for the rest of the day. He laughed at you. Because when you burn the flag, you're not burning the government symbol, you're burning your symbol. That's why the federal government doesn't mind if you burn that flag. Now, I challenge you, the next time you have a rally, burn a UN flag and see what happens. <laughs> and if, if you want to really uh, agitate somebody, I'll tell you which flag to properly burn that, was, that represents them here. It is sometimes available, it is in the same configuration as far as size as a regular flag, banner flag. It is a white field with three stripes at the, at the lower third quadrant and three stars in red. Take that flag to one of your public meetings and burn it, and I guarantee you they'll fight their way through a throng of people to try and get, get it stopped. That is the flag of the New World Order in the United States and the corporate United States. That is not the American flag that you all know, but it actually flies in many locations in Washington right now, and most of you don't even know it. It can be found in flag catalogs, and I highly recommend that it be used as a doormat next time you have a large meeting. <laughs> Forgive me, by the way, because we do carry a UN flag for that purpose, too. We usually duct tape it. And we ask, we should have one door, and we ask that everybody, and you can see how many people are here, we ask that everybody leave by that door. 
one time when somebody videotaped it and all you have is two hours worth of feet going across the UN flag. <laughs> but it's a nice thing to send to the United Nations and to the federal government. Here, this is what we think. Of course, they probably do, uh, do uh, foot inspections for the next 30 years trying to track down everybody's shoes. <laughs> There's a federal agent out there photographing everybody's shoes and feet right now, I'm sure. Just to find those four, five, no six, no seven hundred people that showed up. Now the only other option I have is if I ever find a UN flag flying, and if we ever have this happen over any of your federal buildings or state buildings, we need to know right away. I don't know what could possibly happen to it, but I would suggest, of course, that maybe it should be properly reconfigured and sent back to that federal agency on the roll of toilet paper where it belongs. Best solution. By the way, I notice I didn't necessarily say burn it. I prefer the doormat and the toilet paper solution, and the reason I say this, burning is an honor. This flag, if properly, uh, if, if in need, would have to be burned to be properly destroyed to honor the flag. To do so, the UN flag, of course, is enough of an insult to them on a public occasion that eh, it almost merits it. It's, it's, it's a great symbol. For just as they burn the people at Waco, just as they planned on burning the people in Weaver's situation, just as they seemed to like to use fire to cleanse the country of anybody who would stand against them, so we may have to do the same in reverse. Keep that in mind. The republics. We are the ones who are going to have to stand, says most assuredly our federal government or the federal mechanism is run amok and is not standing up for the Constitution the Bill of Rights. It is going to be the need of these 50 republics or commonwealths to step forward and once again refound the Constitution. And there are many men and women here right now who are participating in that action. You must get involved. At some point in time, I will not be here, and many of the men who are perhaps even standing up will not be here. When that happens, the only option you have is that when I hit the ground, you're going to have to pick that flag up and go with it another 10 yards. When that person falls, another man or woman is going to have to stand up and do the same thing. When that person falls, yet again and again and again. But that's the kind of perseverance you're going to have to learn because the American people seem to throw it out the window. But one way or another, if it's 10 yards at a time, this flag is going to Washington, D.C. again. It is going to be a free nation, and it will take years. It is not going to be months. It's not going to be just weeks or months. It's going to mean a lifetime of commitment. None of you are too busy. I don't ever want to hear that. Too busy to surrender, too busy or so busy that you'll surrender your nation? so busy that most of what you possess you will literally forfeit if they have their way. Listen to some of the most interesting things that have recently happened. A United Nations tax in the United States. Lloyd Benson said it. The G7 meeting that just took place in this last month stated uncategorically they are going to levy a United Nations tax in the United States. That it is now time. Now, I'm going to ask you something about that, because this is the whole thing that bothers me about the UN. Who voted for the membership? Ah, they were appointed. Ah, I see. Who has control then over the money that's spent and how it's going to be spent? Appointed, not elected individuals. Power corrupts, absolute power absolutely corrupts, ladies and gentlemen. The more money they get, the more of your money they'll squander. We all understand also the problem with that is all fabricated money, and to a certain extent, at a certain point in time, we're going to reach a limit. That ties in with many other people, I'm sure, that are here very familiar with the money issue and where it's going. Four years ago, we could demonstrate that there was going to be a money change absolutely positively. And anybody who wants to find the, the, the particular clause in public law, not proposed bill, needs to get a copy or find a copy of in the libraries PL 100-690. Public Law 100-690. Passed in 1989, this literally covers forfeiture laws, confiscation of arms, the national ID card, increasing taxes to levy against property to ensure that they can balance things out at the federal level. It also covers the money chain. Oh, there's never going to be a money change. Well, how many people have seen what's been put in the national press now? Thank you. 
They aren't hiding it anymore because they can't hide it anymore. Also, I will say this. The efforts of many of the good men and women who are here who have already been involved have been successful. We have hurt them. They are scared. And if you don't think so, there's not a person here who can't deny that they've tried to ram down our throats the crime bill and the medical bill immediately. Now I liken this to a predator who has gotten into the, has gotten into the flock. The predator has already fed well. There are bones laying all about him. He's not in total control yet, but his logic is that because he's lulled everybody into a sense of warm fuzzy, that most of us are going to wait until we get eaten individually rather than stand together. Well, the herd's in motion, and we're on the run. While they've been lolling in the shade with a full tummy, we're lean and mean, and we are getting the job done. Now, as they've realize something's amiss and in motion, they started to move themselves. And they are actually getting up and trying to accomplish many of the tasks that they've hoped they would they hope under their own schedule they'd had more time to accomplish. They will not have any more time. If they do not accomplish, and in fact, again, through forcing them to pull off their mask, demonstrate what they really are, if they do not accomplish the task now, they are going to have to pile up even more into a more catastrophic event that will show you and demonstrate to you beyond a shadow of a doubt who you are dealing with. Think about it. Before, and I'll give you the best example because I have here, some gentlemen have already seen this. Thank you, thank God for the patriots across the country. We've got Terry Cook in California. You all saw the Clintonistas and the Emperor with Lord Benson, I mean, Darth Benson. He stood in front of everybody in a joint house session and said, you will all have this, didn't he? I'm doing it exactly the way he did. You will all have this card, and you will not have health benefits if you do not have this card. Now, the press has made a point of not delving into their vast video files and reminding people of what he said in a live joint session. By the way, does anybody remember, as soon as he was done when he did that motion, they, sh they flashed to a shot of Jay Rockefeller? Yes, yeah, so there's no accident to that either. And that is the emperor. Make no mistake, one of them anyway, the sub-emperors sub sub and nothing else. This card, by the way, is the national ID card. And I hope you caught this, because you notice I didn't say medical card this time. The medical card that he showed you was the warm fuzzy you want to give up your rights. Just let us take care of you. <laughs> Just let us handle your problems. You know, I got a bumper sticker that says the new health care pro uh, pro program, the compassion of the IRS. <laughs> Think about it. Yes, the management system of the post office at the prices of the Pentagon. And that's absolutely right. But even that, the health care issue is not the issue. This card is the issue. Never in the history of this nation, and yes, we know they got the Social Security number in. That was the first nose, the camel's nose at the door, to get in the tent. And even that didn't go over very well because, again, back then, Mom didn't raise no fools. Everybody had a good understanding of what was going on. And that's why the Depression had to come about to force a lot of people to get into that system. It was a tool to create the confusion necessary to implement more socialism. Well, this card is the winner. This card is the loser. Both of these can contain 2,000 pages of information on this card. Your photograph, your fingerprints, your signature, a voice print, and any other data, including, of course, your military history, your financial records, and everything else on one card. What did he say? If you do not have it, comrade, you will not get health care. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so instead, the runner-up, by the way, is scary enough. This is actually a microcomputer. In the process, and while they've been generating this card, by the way, they've also come up with another one, the new military ID card. Some of you may have already seen it. 
and I will, and I ask you, and I know there are many people here, but I, you are, who are most assuredly patriots, there are people who are watching, by the way. You're always watching. If you would, I will actually hand these around. Sir, if you would, take these. Return them when you're done. That is the card, and the national ID card, of course, don't leave home without it, will be the mechanism that is used to bring everybody into line. By the way, that card is traceable, and unlike the little computer system chip that we had there, the laser card, as it's called, is almost indestructible on your person. If you do not have it, you will not be serviced. You also will not work, by the way. Oh, they didn't say anything about work with a health care card. That's right. But because they couldn't get the health care card through fast enough, all of a sudden they started talking about a punishment card. Oh, well, they didn't call it that. But that's exactly what it was. The next proposition was, we need a card, but we need a card for people who are on welfare, people who get student loans, individuals who get military benefits. A national ID card for people in the military. Oh, but not for everybody. It'll just be for those guys over there. Isn't that okay, guys? We're just going to punish them. Is that okay? And you were all supposed to go, oh, yeah, that's okay. We need to get them. That didn't work either. Nobody even rose up out of their chairs. Well, let me explain to you how the process would work if they'd gotten away with that. If only 30% of the population got the card, what do you think the first word that's going to come out of their mouth is? Discrimination. And rightly so. It would go to the federal courts. It would take a little time, but I guarantee you that this would be expedited. And the judge would rule that absolutely, that card was discriminatory. Ah, but you're not thinking in federalese, are you? Instead of saying we're going to ban the 30% of the cards that are out there, because the card is discriminatory, you all get the card. Oh, twist of the knife, isn't it? Right to the heart. That's what, that's what the objective of that plan was. It has not worked. So the next step, and two weekends ago, two Fridays ago, you may have caught this, USA Today, page 3, section A, top right quadrant of the paper, it said, the National ID Card Program. Now the card that you have there, we got the information on that, it stated that only one state would be the pilot program. Lo and behold, in the national press, five states will be the pilot states. Five. This, like many other programs, will be implemented. Oh, by the way, you'll have a chance to respond. You're all going to call and respond, aren't you? Yes. I hope so. Yes. But how many people will know who to call? And since we won't know necessarily who to call unless the Patriots get involved and find out who to contact, and we make the noise that's necessary, and we still probably won't stop them, by the way, but we make the noise that's necessary to let them know that we are not satisfied with it, since most people wouldn't know who to call, chances are there will be a comment made in the Senate that they had the test program set up, they did the research, nobody complained, the National EID card program will now go to the rest of the nation. And then on the streets of America you're going to hear something that you all told us you would never hear in your lifetime. May I see your papers? By the way, if you don't have your papers on you, what is the punishment? Has anybody ever heard of a term called indefinite detention? If you were stopped for not having your national ID card, under the indefinite detention clauses which were passed from 1989 through 1990, and under the Emergency Powers Act can be implemented at any time, you can be held for up to two years without trial, without lawyer, and without charges being filed. Ah, it gets rid of their ominous, doesn't it? That's the national ID card, the warm fuzzy that they can't quite sell to us all. I personally know for a fact that the day that that happens when they attempt it, I will not take the national ID card and I will probably be unemployed. I also know for a fact that that means that it is one of many lines, I think there will be others drawn, there are others drawn before this, that will be one of the lines that will probably start the war. Because if you, yeah, if not sooner. And the reason I say this is because you had best look or turn to the children you might have brought with you here today. If we are stupid enough to let this happen, then those children have the right to turn and curse us for the rest of our lives. Because if you're willing to sell your posterity for a few shekels, for a few pieces of silver, 
and in exchange sell the rest of your descendants into chains, then you don't deserve that freedom perhaps anyway. And we better learn. On the other hand, I'll say this, I swear to you that if need be, I will die to protect their right. I will not stop, and we will not stop talking, we won't stop, well actually, when we stop talking, let's put it this way, we will be pulling. Okay, it's very simple. That and a few other things, etc. We know how to use a lot of interesting toys and we have them. By the way, the most common question that's asked about that is, and it has to do with when we have to protect our families and we have to protect our rights, where will the military stand? Where will law enforcement stand? Well, I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, you make that decision, not me. I've provided tools and implements that you can use, but you are the master builders. You are the men and women that will decide whether or not your fellow patriots will stand with us or whether or not they are traitors and she'll stand against the Republic. But your effort and you getting involved is what's going to count. There are a hundred million men out there from prior service to present military service. Some have the knowledge and already know what's going on, but there are others who haven't been spoken to yet. How many of you have taken the information that you have, if you are knowledgeable, and walked up to a police officer and said, here, where will you stand when it comes time to protect the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? When was the last time you talked to a soldier you saw in an airport terminal or a bus station? Or just happened to see in a restaurant? One of the things, and one of the people, and many of you may have it, how many of you have your pocket constitutions handy? Good. There are some. And there might be some here. Are there any on the table? Excellent. Let me ask you something. You were in the Army. Did anybody ever walk up to you and give you a copy of the Constitution? Yeah, and there's laughter for a reason, isn't there? Think about that. You know how meaningful it is after a man has raised his hand and sworn an oath of allegiance to protect your Constitution, to have you walk up and for a change say, here, this is what I stand for and I know this is what you swore to protect. Perhaps it's about time you got a chance to read it. And remember that it's ours. Not theirs, ours, ours. Now, there's some who will deny it. Remember and mark those people well. You'll also find out who your enemies are sometimes. That creates a long list, I know. But it's a list that should be made nonetheless to remember who your enemies are in this time because in the future you'll know who to turn to and who to turn away from. I will offer the Republic, and I assuredly will defend the Republic alongside anyone who is willing to stand for it. I do not care about age. I do not care about creed or color. That's not relevant, ladies and gentlemen. You better all remember that. Only a fool fights in a burning house. This house most assuredly is on fire. When we're all done, we get our own little pieces of real estate, and we can decide for ourselves how we will internally manage our, our country. That is a decision that will have to be made, and we're all going to have to participate. Somebody asked me this, uh, and every time it's come up most recently, well, Mark, what do we do once we win? How, how can we ensure that a dictator won't take over? You know how that's going to happen? Because you, by you doing what you're doing right now and staying in those chairs when there's a meeting, that when the city council meets and the township council meets and when the county meets and when something's happening nationally, you must stay involved. If you do not, you have but yourself to blame for the tyranny that may develop. Now, there's a thing that's happened also, I will remind you, you, you need to turn to your special warfare manuals. You should get a copy of the Special Forces Manual on Guerrilla Warfare. The very last chapter is very important to read. It explains what to do with the guerrillas and with the patriots when they've won. Bring them in and feed them, clean them up, give them some fruit salad for their chest and then determine whether or not they're a risk and arrest them and detain them when they're done. Treachery. So when you win, notice I don't say if you win. I know, that, I know that the lack of tenacity of the enemy, 
when we win, and we're actually managing this country, you better make sure that the only thing you worry about is your brothers in arms and your sisters in arms. Thank each other for the glorious deeds that you've committed to, and go home. And be ready to fight again. Bury every rifle, every tank, every rocket, anything you get your hands on, and then go steal more. Put it away. But just as the, as the Sons of Liberty had to learn at the end of the American Revolution, if they were not ready for war, and if they had not been there to plant the seed, the War of 1812 would have been very different, wouldn't it? Remember, in, in, in the war, war of the Revolution, we won. We beat the snot out of the most powerful nation on the planet, and then they came back. Just as we will be victorious, they shall return. It will happen again, because we have a cherished prize. You know, my, a couple of my friends that came with me, one of them looked out, and he's just awe-inspired by the mountains. I am too. To appreciate being able to travel over this country and understand what you have, to be able to go from the, from the flatlands and from the deserts to the Rocky Mountains, to the Smokies, to the swamps of Florida, and they have their own beauty, you have the most precious gem on this planet, and it already is your heritage. There are men that want it. We can preserve that beauty, but we're also going to have to pay a price perhaps for it. The NJTF police, FinCEN, the United Nations forces, all of these are terror convolutions. All of them trying to imply that there is always a force that will crush you if you say anything. If you rise up, whatever you do, they're going to destroy you. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll repeat, at Waco they won the first battle, they just gave up the campaign. Had they continued to engage and destroy the aggressor and effectively eliminated that first fighting force, oh, and by the way, shot the camera crews too. Yeah. They would have had all of the physical evidence of the attack. Now, your enemy is much, is, he always works in the dark. Let me give you an example. After the Waco uh, butchery that took place, we had the dog and pony show, remember the explanation of what happened. Now this is a media-oriented population, video-oriented, audio-oriented. And yet, when the talking heads came before on the national television screens, the wall was as blank as this one right here. There was never a single reference to the hours and hours and hours of media footage that was taken during the first attack on Waco. And what that tells me is that they were out and out lying beyond a shadow of a doubt because if there had been anything to show that the Federals had not fired first and that they were being merciful and kind little Nazis, <laughs> then you'd have seen it on the big screen behind the talking heads. The very fact that not a single screen was there and that they never even referred to any of the footage tells me who the guilt lies upon. Well, just as they travel in the dark, we travel in the light. Somebody asked me, how can you do this? Very simply, you get up on a podium, you stand over here in front of the microphone, and you talk. Well, wouldn't they be coming after you? Oh, yes, trust me, they have made efforts to create problems for us. The other problem is this. If I were in some way trying to create an illusion, most assuredly, and if I were, of course, to demonstrate panic, and if they wanted to take me to a court of law, I'm sure they would try, they would try to do so to get me out of here. If they could demonstrate that I was trying to create a revolution, they would do everything in their power. And you'll notice I never use that term because I do not believe in any way, shape, or form this is a revolution, ladies and gentlemen, and I do not want to see you use that term either. We are the defenders. You are morally right. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's only one thing that I stand for, the Constitution and Bill of Rights. I will hold that before me when I go into battle. It is because of that that most assuredly nobody wants to bring anything up that might be rather incriminating down the road, especially in a confrontation. 
because many, many, many people who are in the system that you will privately talk to now in the future if you go about becoming a little more blunt will admit to you openly that what we're talking about is taking place. But you know what the most common question I have from the military is? And some of you might even be in the military but are plain clothes today. That's okay. The most common question that I hear from good men and women, faithful men and women is, when we stand to fight, when we throw these individuals down, will the American people stand with us? That's right. The soldier will do the best that he can, but you have to be there. Now there's something you'll notice I said. I didn't say back him up. And I didn't say stand in front. I said stand with him, shoulder to shoulder. You know why? It's real easy to say, I'll fight to the last drop of your blood. <laughs> that's right. But it's another thing to put your money where your mouth is. And that's what they're worried about. Oh, by the way, don't think the enemy hasn't been figuring out that something's been going on. Before we came down here on cable with the uh, one of the uh, uh, Hollywood talk shows, they were discussing a new movie that's just come out. Oh, by the way, it's not a new movie. It's a remake of one you may be familiar with, Seven Days of May. They just redid it, and they called it The Enemy Within. The New World Order is trying to bring global peace. And, of course, a young officer finds out that there are these patriotic Americans that are trying to maintain control over the country and won't let the UN do its proper job. It's going to be on the stands very quickly, and I'm amazed it was probably shot out within a very short period of time, and it's to try and do damage control. Again, we have to demonstrate to our brothers and sisters in the military, our fellow citizens, that we will back them, and that yes, we understand the need for it. I will also say this, though. Once we win, we can never let what has happened happen again. What that means is this. Ladies and gentlemen, but especially men, for ladies, I do not prefer putting you into combat, nor would I think about it. And I know that maybe some would have, have second, you know, second uh, comments about that. But we are men of the West. I would try to, try to shield all of my people. Unfortunately, we've done a good job of that to a certain extent. We've shielded more than we should have. I will shield my women and children to the best of my ability and protect them from any harm. But that also means that men, you are going to have to stand up and participate and become part of the militia at large. It's because we created specialization and created a standing professional military force that George Washington warned you all about. A standing army is the bane of a free nation. And was George wrong? Because look what is happening now. They are taking that force and twisting its purpose. Changing the oath of office, changing the oath, no longer to swear allegiance to the Constitution, but to swear allegiance to the corporate United States and to the United Nations. Some of you may have seen this mag, the, uh, the news, newspaper release here that's excellent, this particular flyer that was generated. I want you all, please, to read the piece on the military interviews that were done by flyer that asked them what their attitude was about shooting on American citizens. They've already been asking this question. When the U.S. government bans firearms, would you be willing to fire on American citizens who will not surrender their weapons? Well, we have no reason to surrender our weapons. It is unconstitutional to do so. The reason, and you all have those little pocket constitutions out there to look at when you're done. Let me a break here. Pick up one for yourself, and I want you to look at it. The Bill of Rights is unalienable, not inalienable. Even were the document to be shredded and burned tomorrow, those are your God-given rights. They cannot be taken away. They cannot be destroyed. They are yours to possess for as long as you live here on this earth. And yet somebody would tell you that we can simply cast this document aside and take the UN Charter. Yes. Oh, what webs they weave. Well, sadly enough, 
There are attempts right now in our Constitution that will try to do this. Many of you here may also be involved with the fight against the CONCON, Constitutional Convention. Many of you here may have heard of this only for the first time. We are only two states away from losing the Constitution administratively. There are two documents in motion, but one is the most likely. It's called the New States of America Constitution. The preamble states, the 50 United States of America are abolished. The 10 regional governments of the New States of America are established. Regional government? Uh-oh, where have we heard this before? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's already been implemented. It's already in place. You can find a regional government listed in your phone book. Understand this, you all know how convenient it is to deal with state government right now, don't you? Of course, if you call, you'll get an immediate response, won't you? Well, you won't. Well, imagine this, with regional government, the capital is even farther away, and the central regime that controls all records, all information, all finances, your child's control, you know, your child's life, and literally all government will be even farther away, and even more remote, remote bureaucratically. By the way, no individual who will be part of the regional government is elected. They are all assigned directly by the president under the new States of America Constitution. Freedom of religion shall be a privilege, and I'm reading from their document. Freedom of religion shall be a privilege, not a right, granted by the overseer. Overseer? Who's that? Ah. Anybody ever read the UN Charter? You'll notice when you read the UN Charter and US, UN, UN Constitution, the way it's set up, an overseer decides all rights and all rights are arbitrary at the discretion of the administration at that time. That's what you're trading for, arbitrary enforcement. What about the last check and balance that you all have in this nation right now? Your last protection that's still intact in the Constitution. Trial by jury. Randy Weaver found out in the end that yes, there was still some remnant of that intact, didn't he? In the Waco trials, with the exception of a, a jurist who decided to try and compromise with the government to make everybody happy, that came up with the manslaughter, the manslaughter charge, I'm sorry, manslaughter conviction, were it not for that compromise and had the, had the jury a little more intestinal fortitude, those people should have all walked away. But they did not because the jury, the jurists were scared. They did not fully understand the power that they held in their hand. Well, under the New States of America Constitution, jury by trial shall be decided by the judge, not by the defendant. You won't see another jury trial in this country again, for obvious reasons. Your peers will not be able to sit amongst you and decide from all the facts whether or not you are guilty or innocent. That will be destroyed. Interestingly enough, the New States of America Constitution is only a short way from actually being, in, being enacted. If that takes place, heaven help us all, and again, he has a right to curse us all. Because that's just another avenue that they have appointed to try and destroy the, the sovereignty of this nation. And again, I still have to ask that same question. Nobody's ever explained to me, who's the overseer? That's a rather ominous uh, description, isn't it, of somebody in charge? The overseer? As if you were all what? Slaves. As if you were all chattel and property to be traded at the discretion of state government. Is this the same overseer that is overseeing your land? Possibly. That's, that is a possibility. We're, not, we're never given a definition of who the overseer is, by the way. And in most cases, with all the documents that have been generated by the New World Order, oh, don't say that on Rush Limbaugh show, by the way, right? Don't say New World Order. Well, we say it constantly because the other side's been using it for years and then finally publicly came out with it. The New World Order, one way or another, will attempt from a series of avenues of approach to try and take our nation. I think you've all seen it. How many here are involved with homeschooling? We all know the threat to homeschooling right now, don't we? By the way, we brought an article with this. It's not, I don't think it's here. That right now, we've won a great victory for homeschooling in Michigan. 
they are now going to try and come at us from another direction. They are suing, several senators are suing the people who won to try and turn the, the uh, law around that allows us to use our own money for homeschooling or use it at our discretion. They're going after the children. Everybody voted for the last tax hike, didn't they? The federal one that you all probably called in on, many of you were active, and they did not listen. Okay. Law enforcement, we've gone over. We all know where that's headed. And why it is they need to wrest the secret police, or bring the secret police in and wrest our local police from us. You should be thankful if you have a policeman who's actually doing his job, and you should make a point of thanking him if he's still doing his job. It's hard. He's had so many things put in front of him to create a situation where he cannot effectively function. Not accidentally, it's intentional to create contention and confusion, by the way. Why? Because your enemies want an us and them confrontation. They want law enforcement against the civilian population, which was not the correct term because he's supposed to be a peace officer. And we aren't civilians, we're sovereigns. They want black fighting white, Hispanic fighting black. Jew and Gentile, anybody, everybody can get their hands on to fight amongst themselves. So that while we're busy facing each other at the low plane, we don't bother to look up 15 degrees to see who's pulling the strings. Do not waste that effort. If you have time, for instance, and I've seen this, and especially I want to, I want to comment on this real quick. We're going to be taking a break. I do not want to hear you fighting amongst yourselves or, or backstabbing or any disagreements that if you have a disagreement, bringing it to a head in a public meeting. That only adds fuel to the enemy's fire. We may have our disagreements, but we must put them aside, all egos, all contentions, and replace it with a burning hatred for an enemy that will eat our lunch. to be expensive. You, are, first of all, will not have enough of anything that you like to have or that you need, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget that. We fortunately have organized, for instance, in our militias, we have field hospitals, medical units, evacuation units, civil defense operations. We have production for manufacture of arms and equipment, sub-factories and small manufacturing dispersed all over the Midwest, all the way down to including nothing more than simply little basement factories or nothing more than a single mill or a drill press or whatever. But the manufacturing and the capability to create an infrastructure to support our military in the future is going to have to be done by you. Why do you think they've centralized everything? Why do you think they took many things out of the nation and shipped them virtually overseas? George Washington warned us about this also, by the way, that we must maintain industry in this nation. When they talked about artisans and craftsmen, they weren't talking Maplethorpe and Piscrice. They were talking Bluebird and Bridgeport. They were talking about the men who are out there in this audience right now who know how to use their hands and fabricate what we needed, machinery. Not just weapons of war, what about farm implements? What about the everyday necessities just to live? When we fought the American Revolution, the misery of Valley Forge was a reality because we did not have the capability to produce. And it is no accident, and in fact it is long-term planning that is intentionally destroying that capability now. They're doing as much as they can, as quickly as they can, in the shortest period of time that they can. They're in a mad rush. Now what I'd like to do, and what we normally do with a format like this, I've laid the groundwork, but I'm going to go, go through a question and answer session. This way, you all have a lot of things that I can't necessarily bring up right away. My, my little mind here I look at is a lumber yard. You ever had a lumber yard? Most of the time you know where the two by twos are, but every once in a while you misplace them. When you guys hit me with a two by four side of the head and I jostle some of the lumber out, usually find what it is we need. What I want to do is be able to provide you with the tools that you need. Now, when the time comes, by the way, there's a lot of people ask me this, what can I do? What can I do? Oh my goodness, they're going to win. They're not going to win. How long it takes to win depends upon us. Us, not me, not just one of you, us. If you do it, if you drive the knife into their vitals and twist it and turn it the right way, the right weapon, the right place, at the right time, you don't need billions. 
You don't need hundreds of thousands. You simply need that right implement in the right place at the right time, and we have it. The American people will do with numbers what we do not have with money. Why do you think they're trying to keep us separated and making sure we don't talk to each other? They want us isolated. They want us separated, segregated, and confused. We have a common, cohesive threat that we all have to face. We will deal with it. Now, I guess at this point in time, we're going to have Ron Brown come back up. I'm going to take a little break. When we come back, write down things. Remember, write them down. I'd like you to be polite, because I know some people are going to shout things out. We'll take as long as is necessary to answer any questions that you have. Is that acceptable? They wanted a vacuum 
so that when the time came, they could drop anything into that hole they wanted because we would demand peace. We would demand uh, control of crime, which the Clinton administration doesn't lie about, by the way. They're only interested in going after criminals, not after the legal guns. The problem is we'll all be criminals. Amen. Use their definitions. When you're listening to these people, you better pull out their dictionary. Don't think you can assume you know what they're talking about. We will all be criminals. Well, many people will be, I won't say thrown to the side. What's going to happen is they're just simply going to be static as this thing continues. If I were to die to them today, I would be alive on Memorex for the next 10 years. Fact? How many of your big copies of the tapes we already have? Oh, you're guilty. <laughs> okay? And there's people I know who are going to say, oh, I did 300. <laughs> you know what? That's why we did it. We only probably constitute about one tenth of one percent of all the tapes that have been made. We know by rough counting that over a million copies of American Peril were already generated. Yeah. That was not an accident, by the way. I've had many men and women who, who are now working with us who came to us before totally incredulous. And what happened is they came in and took the information and ran with it, which is what I want you to do. Notice I'm not going to spoon feed everybody. I want you, to, because my time is precious too, by the way, and it's limited. You spend some of your time. You go out and do the research. And when you come back and you have it all in your hands, you tell me. Because you can't make excuses anymore, by the way. There's no way to. The other side, in their urgency, are printing it all, in, all on paper. They're putting it on the boot tube. They're generating it on radio. The sad part is this. Most of the information I've already told you about is three and four years old. If I can do it with what limited resources I have, then you tell me why the media hasn't brought it up. Because they're running. Because they're already running. That's right. Thank you. They're already under their control. And the fact that. In most cases, an example, how many people saw U.S. News uh, and World Report a week ago that had the, uh, the article on militias in the United States? Some of you did. Others need to look for it. It was last week. Now, I'll tell you one basic rule about intelligence. When dealing with an enemy, you never offer favorable intelligence to the opposition because, first, it can also recruit from the general population that's ignorant of what's going on. And it also gives the, uh, the opposition intelligence data that they need to identify that they're being successful. That article was a great compliment to all of you who are sitting here who have been working for years. It could not be hidden anymore, so they had to do a damage control piece. And it was a very poor one at best, though it covered a lot that many people have been scratching their heads about. You know how many people have come up and said, did you see this? Did you see this? At work. Not just around the country, but when I'm home. That's the, most, that's the most interesting effect because a lot of what the other side has assumed is that those tapes out there didn't exist. They didn't even know what had actually happened. And we intentionally did them that way for that reason. We didn't go to the general media. We went right to the grassroots and to the people. Let them judge. Let them decide. Now, at some point in time, as I said, we are going to fall. I hope, by the way, to see the end of this. I do not ever want to hear anybody with a death wish. Oh, I'm going to fight and die on the. No, I don't want you to do that. I want you to be as stubborn and as obstinate and as belligerent as you possibly can be and live to see the end because that's the best slap in the face for the other side that you can accomplish. Yeah. To live to see the other end of it. There's a lot of gray haired people here you can talk to. You don't just have to talk to me. There's a lot of gray haired grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles. Moms and dads who have seen a lot of what we're talking about, and not just this part of the scheme, but the long picture. This has been coming for a long time. Well, mom and dad, grandpa and grandpa, you know what? You're not going to get a chance to retire again, I'm sorry. In fact, because of the gross shortage of teachers that we are, we are, we are in need of, none of you are going to get a chance to rest very much in your lifetime. If you're really, genuinely, earnestly interested in the, in, the, in the future of this nation. I want to challenge you with something because this is what I've been planning across the country intentionally. There's no accident to it. 
A lot of you are worried about what will happen in the next few months when we do have to go to war or if we have to fight. A lot of you are also looking far enough out to say, what will we do if there is a conflict over a number of years? Well, let me ask you something, because I said it earlier. What do you do when we win? We have to start thinking in long terms. There are men and women here talking about the Constitution. They need to be the new teachers again. In our history books, in our textbooks, we must cover and discuss and create a constant discussion on the history of this nation and how it came about. Our goal is to ask this question, though. Not only do I know where this country is going to be 10 years from now, but I ask you this. Where do you want to see this nation 50 years from now? Free. Free. Where do you want to see this nation 100 years from now? Free. Free. That means you have to work now. To see a future of that, to make that your goal, do what the enemy has done in their own tight-knit little circles. Our goal must be generational. Imagine the glory of being able to touch this young man and educate him and this young man here who will replace us someday and knowing that if we do right, he will live to be perhaps a hundred. And you, grandma or mom or dad, are already in your 60s or 70s. If this young man lives to be a hundred, you will have touched a hundred and fifty to almost two centuries worth of history. And if you've done the job right, imagine and cherish the thought that if he's taught right, he's going to teach somebody else the same way, and you will have touched hundreds of years. You will pass on a heritage that is priceless. The enemy cannot defeat that. There's nothing they can do to stop it. And the important thing is we wrest the prize from them before they attempt to destroy it now. some areas, sadly enough, there'll be people who will be heavily documented. A little note here about this ID card, by the way. Is anybody here from Indiana? Oh, good. A few from Indiana. Do you know that Indiana has a law, or maybe you've heard of this, but I'll bring it to your attention. When you go home, ask about it. Maybe you haven't heard. If you're stopped on Indiana's highways and you do not have your driver's license with you, you are issued a citation. Now, of course, this happens in other states. However, the important difference is this. The citation is then kept on your record for 10 years now. If at any time within that 10 year period you are pulled over for not having your papers, you will serve a 60 day mandatory jail sentence for a misdemeanor. You cannot plea bargain the issue. They will not change the charge. And unlike all other misdemeanors on the books, it is an absolute punishment that must be fulfilled. This is Indiana law at this time. Now, what do you think that's getting ready for? The card. Right there. We don't need that stinky card. <laughs> we don't need no stinky card. Right. <laughs> I don't like your badges either. I don't either. That's right. Well, there have been a lot of exciting things, and I'm not going to hit you all with gloom and doom. Let me tell you, give you an idea of what's happening in this country. <coughs> We've been blessed with the fact that many patriots have assisted. Now, we don't have any resources, and we don't do anything other than put everything right back into whatever we're doing. We're, we're committing everything that we have, all the time that we have, to this. But I've been from Florida to Montana 
from California to Connecticut and almost every state in between. I've been blessed with the opportunity to meet with patriots from almost every militia command or unit in every one of those states at different times. In Florida, the individual counties are passing militia laws which will authorize the county to directly support the militia at large in each county. Nine counties have already passed the ordinance. Nine. You better be proud of that because that's one state. Now they work right across the panhandle and they're working down into the body of the state itself. Some of the larger metropolitan areas probably won't pass an ordinance. But this is one of many efforts that are being made to draw the line. Because that's going to be a question asked here. What's going to start this? And I'll answer that when it happens, when, it, when the question's asked. But what about the rest of the states? Well, militia of Montana, MOM, has been very successful, so much so that the enemy's eyes are upon them now. That was that article we talked about, U.S. News and World Report. They are doing an excellent job of getting information out. Militias in virtually every state are already formed. Some of your states have a home guard that you may not even know about. 17 states have home guard militias that are supported by the state. Texas has one, Michigan has one, and I've been in the military since 1975 and didn't know about it. Not until only a few years ago. And in trying to find out who runs it, who's in charge, it's an enigma. It's a very well kept secret. Uh, and gradually we found out by making contact with some of the commanders that most recently the federal government tried to come in and take the militias, the home guard militia of Michigan's equipment away from them to try and ship it to Indiana. Now, yeah, I see that sounds strange to us too because first of all, it's home guard. They don't leave the state. And what they in reality were doing was trying to deactivate these guard, these home guardians because this ripple has been going through the whole system. They do not know who they can trust anymore. And they most assuredly don't trust the militias and they don't trust the National Guard. You've all been seeing what's happening as they're cutting forces out. Another mechanism that is coming into full flower, and that is FEMA, which many of you are familiar with. Yeah. Might meet some employees here with FEMA. <laughs> Federal Emergency Management Agency has had the capability to virtually take over the government for over a decade and a half almost now. FEMA was developed out of the original Civil Defense Program. The problem is that it is not user or has not been user friendly. As with, as with most parts of the government, the perceived enemy is the American people. Now the one good thing about civil defense in the past was that it was user friendly and that you participated, got directly involved and assisted in the operations and it was dispersed. Now just the reverse, everything is centralized. That's not exactly good to conducive to good national health if you get into a major knockdown drag out fight, ladies and gentlemen, because when you put all your eggs in one basket, what does somebody need to do? Squash one place and everything's gone. Centralization kills. With militia commanders and everybody else that's involved, you must remember that also. Centralization kills. Our primary concern is protecting all of our resources and assets. FEMA was originally involved with a project which I touched on back in 1982. It was the series of Rex exercises. The last of the primary, of uh, the last premium exercise of this type was <coughs> Rex 84. Some of you are familiar with that, others will have to be educated. Rex 84 called for the, if necessary, takeover of the United States by FEMA and a shadow government, or literally 50 men, pre-designated in executive orders. There are an additional 50 personnel who would take over for the other 50 in the event any of those men were killed or missing during a time of crisis. Everybody first thinks, ah, nuclear war, wrong. The exercise determined that in the event of quote unquote economic catastrophe, civil unrest. In other words, remember back in 1980 or 1979, as Ronald Reagan did discuss, he openly talked about the CFR, the Trilateral Commission, and the United Nations, and that was the threat that they were hoping to protect. That in the event they implemented a United Nations control of the United States or a new world order takeover operation of some kind, that FEMA could be used to assist in that. And in fact, we can see today that FEMA has been given extended powers. FEMA was involved in the Weaver siege, by the way, which most people seem to have wanted to ignore. And this is public information. They assisted in the coordination of communications control, local broadcasting, etc. 
That's why very little information came out of the area and why the National Wire Services did not pick it up. Needless to say, FEMA has also been involved in humanitarian operations, but that is part of its mission. It was not ready for it because it has been geared for other projects. Now, I will say this. FEMA, in reality, probably will be replaced very shortly. Everybody's going to go, hmm, how, do you, how could you imagine that? Well, the fact that we're allowed to see so much about a government mechanism and that we know too much about it tells me that there's something in the wings ready to take over for it. We're only allowed to know so much, and the fact that we know, we know as much as we do about them tells me that that's old information. So keep that in mind. There is another agency or mechanism in the wings. We don't even know what alphabet soup combination it is yet, but it is in motion, and it will take the place of what, is, what we presently know to be FEMA. In many cases, FEMA was originally involved in the, pro, in, in the creation of the national detention camps, which a lot of people have asked about. Now, one of the first places to go if you really want to know a lot about FEMA with regard to their mobilization orders, your public libraries. He goes, Burr? Yes, that's right. In your public libraries, especially if it's an older one that has been maintained very well, in other words, the federal marshals haven't come in and confiscated books off the shelf, you may find a tremendous amount of old data, especially from the 70s through the early 80s, that pertains to FEMA mobilization and FEMA detention operations. Many people across the country are right now searching their particular libraries, especially in rural areas, for the documentation that's needed to demonstrate the path leading up to today. Now, the detention camps originally authorized number 23 primary and then an indefinite number of secondary detention camps. Under the DOD budget amendment that I was suggesting you look for, which was passed in 19, 1989 for the 1990 fiscal year, our own Senator Carl Levin was able to force through 20 additional detention camps being funded in addition to the involvement of the Civil Air Patrol by DEA, making them more a federal policing agency than a civil support unit that eventually would feed people into the Air Force. Additional camps were authorized, and as we've recommended to many people, look for what's not there, not what's specifically written. Go to your plat maps. Survey areas where you suspect activity, because most of you have seen something. And rule number one, we've asked this of everybody, and some of you probably have already done it, some of you have sent us information, a throwaway camera. If you see something, photograph it. We'll sort it out later, or you can, if you have the mechanisms at this end. A 110, a 126, or a 35 millimeter throwaway costs you between three and ten dollars. Photograph it. Also come up with intelligence reports. We do a sit rep where we train people to use sit reps to try and document activities. Who, what, where, when, what were you doing, what were they doing. By having a consistent report, ladies and gentlemen, we can more effectively first sort through the data, verify or deny, and then catalog the information so that we have a progressive calendar. Now the problem is this, we're not a professional intelligence mechanism and none of you are. And we're going to be inundated with data, just the reverse. We're buried at our end. In fact, we're blessed, but we're buried, okay? Because of that, though, we have a good overview of what's happening across the nation with regard to movements. You've all heard of the trucks at Saucier that are Russian. If you haven't, you're hearing about it maybe for the first time. They originally landed in Gulfport. We know also of Hind D helicopters and other aircraft that are being transported and used all over the country. The magazine Spotlight has actually been generating information now and trying to verify or deny specific information that's been handed off to them. And they're one of several publications, they're not the only one. Russian personnel and foreign troops, most recently the 425th LERP, unit, LERP uh, company, which was the old 40th Ranger, which I was affiliated with, was converted back in the late 70s. In contacting several of the individuals that are involved with this unit, have been training Spesnaz personnel within the last month. Originally, the cover story is that they were La they were Lithuanians. They were not. They were Russian Spesnaz personnel. We had three companies at Fort Grayley. I'm sorry, Camp Grayley. Make sure you get that right. The difference between Camp and Fort. Also, other foreign nationals have been on site, not just in Michigan, but throughout the country. Now, the most common question I or comments made is, well, we've always had soldiers, foreign soldiers in this country. Yes, we've had some. 
And most of the soldiers even who have retired, for the, who served in the last 20 years, did, yes, experience foreign nationals to different degrees. But being older soldiers, many of you remember that traditionally, those foreign forces could not even bear arms in this country, first of all. Through gradualism, we went from training small elements to training larger groups to the point now where it is being admitted on national television that we are going to have even larger formations stationed than any of us expected. That we're going to see foreign troops rotated here and vice versa. The questionnaire that we remember everybody's worried about said, would you be willing to fire on American citizens? They won't have to. You'll have foreign nationals doing it. And let me ask you this. If they're wearing a ski mask and an unmarked black uniform, who are they? Dead. Dead? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. I have to agree with that. But the point is, that's why this, grad the way this gradual progression is not a single event, it's not a single action, and it's not a single issue. A lot of you been, uh, have your own specialized specialty, but you're going to have to generalize again because they're tied in. The gentleman was asking about this outside. How have they been, or what, you know, how have they been doing this? And you know, what would their progression be? Well, Peel 100-690 is like half of a wall. It's not a wall built up from below a block at a time because you can see the foundation rising. Instead, they virtually in a day, plop, put half of the wall up. Even as we speak, the House and the Senate are going to be deciding the fate of firearms in this country, perhaps today, if it hasn't already been done. That crime bill is the other half of the wall, and when they come together, the cement will bomb them quite well. That is reality, not fiction or illusion, and there's nothing you can do to hide from it. These are the most sweeping and dynamic crime packages, or for that matter, legislative packages, this nation has ever seen. None of the people voting on it, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, have read it. The GPO, Government Printing Office, has not even generated a copy for distribution yet because it's been modified time and again. Any of you buy a product that way? The people supposedly representing you are. Now, I hate to tell you, I fire people, I fire people who do things like that, and we may have to. With the crime bill and crime package brought together, all of these different agencies we've been discussing today are given even greater power. But one of the most interesting things are the death penalties. A lot of you said, oh yeah, you know, I can understand some death penalties for some of these crimes. Oh, but you should look at some of them that they have included. Example, if I take a ball peen hammer and I go out here to the interstate right now, and I wall up on that cement with my little ball peen hammer, that is a terrorist act punishable by death. If I go out to the railroad, railroad yard here, take my little ball peen hammer again and start wailing on the track, that is a terrorist act punishable by death. Now, we've had terrorists try and function in this country for years, and I was involved in a lot of activity in the late 70s in which we identified organizations that were real organizations that bombed the snot out of this country, and you never heard once about them. And what's fascinating is when they want you to hear it, they will. When they don't, they make it disappear. That has to do with this whole idea of friendly and unfriendly intelligence to deny access. Well, what kind of people would attack, let's see, interstate highways and rail yards? Let's say that we go into the type of situation we're talking about where we have a national uh, confrontation between the internationalists and us. Wouldn't you be attacking places like Super highways and railroads. Oh. In fact, if you look at the list of laws that they're passing, they're more in line with facing off and, in fact, threatening individuals who might have to fight you on the battlefield as opposed to, quote unquote, terrorists just randomly destroying I 94. Okay? You better start reading what it is they're printing because when you put it in line with the rest of the data that's available, it makes a great deal more sense. Notice I said something here, too. Interstate and defense highway network. Does everybody understand that we're only being allowed to use the expressways? They are not for use by the civilian population. Just like Germany's Autobahn was built by Hitler before the war to speed his armies to victory, the expressways of today are a defense network. 
When the time comes, you will not have access, and part of FEMA's mission is to ensure that those roads are controlled and are limited even great, to an even greater extent than they are now. But you pay for it with your dollars. Congratulations. More and more it ties in all oh, the evil webs they weave, as we know. But again, good things. Well, the militia of Ohio is organizing and geometrically expanding on almost a daily basis. The militias of Indiana, of Illinois, of Missouri, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, have doubled, quadrupled, sextupled in size. And we've seen most of them. So you are not alone by any stretch of the imagination. Imagine out there, as I said before, and I will say it again, imagine getting involved and doing even more damage to them by finding all those people out there who are questioning but don't have the ammunition. Think of how much damage you will do to the enemy. Perhaps, if we are really, really, really lucky, and I do not foresee this, by force of numbers, we may slow them down a bit. They know they can't wait, though. That's why they've gone into high gear. So that's not going to happen. But again, we must hope for the best and assume the worst. That way we won't be disappointed. Now what I'd like to do, and I guess what we'll do is stand up and I'll probably have to repeat it. Do we have a microphone? Two up. Excellent. Fantastic. Each if aisle. you would, each aisle, there's one here and one there. Raise your hand if you have a question. If you would, or step up to the microphone and line up if there's any question that you have. And don't be embarrassed and don't worry about what it is that you're going to ask. Have you heard a report that we're going to decommission about 155 out-of-date Army bases, Navy bases in this country? Have you heard what the one characteristic of most all of those bases is? I can guess that it's probably that they're successful and cost-efficient. They are ammunition supply depot. Okay, yes. We have approximately 86 percent of all the ammunition stored in the United States on those depots. Do you know what we're going to do with that ammunition? And then, oh, sorry, go ahead, it is to be destroyed. Yep. And they are in the process right now of making the arrangements for the destruction of that. Yes. And at that time, how much ammunition will we have per unit, whether it be a battleship or a uh, individual soldier? The very, well, the very fact that he, the point that he brings up is an important fact that must be understood by everybody. What I said earlier, we are at a boiling point, a nexus in time that is very, very important. Clinton authorized an additional $358 million to destroy the munitions that he's talking about. We were understood that at least one arsenal in Louisiana was being used, but if they're doing it in New Mexico, well, the only thing I can say there, too, is if their time is right, you guys will be pretty well resupplied if we do it fast enough. <laughs> if we're quick. On the other hand, this is something that has to be considered. As he said, that we measure in the military, especially with, combat, with the combat arms, we measure our overall combat fighting strength in terms of days. Many of the factories that were producing munitions have already been shut down over the last two years. Those that are producing munitions are shipping a lot of ammunition south of the border to fight the, uh, the, the present civil war there. Remington Arms is taking most of its inventory and selling it directly to law enforcement for the up and coming battle. As we all know, and many of you can raise your hands and attest to this, is it easy to get primers right now, yes or no? <laughs> I went down to the gun shop here, by the way, and saw the empty boxes. Now that's a good sign, by the way, because what that means is the equipment has been dispersed. That means it's out in the hands of the people where it needs to be. Is it enough to fight a long, protracted war? Well, we're going to have to make it that way. And you might have noticed an article most recently was done in Guns and Ammo. Did anybody see it? It, was an, it wasn't an editorial, but it was a single piece, three pages long, in which the man brought up the issue about Rhodesia and how they took the selector switches off the combat rifles and stuck and kept them on semi-automatic fire to conserve ammunition. The Rhodesian military never lost a battle. They lost on the negotiating tables. We have good, capable, strong soldiers who will fight. The important thing is we build up that infrastructure I was talking about, separating manufacturing, 
Many of you here are very well skilled, and I don't want you to raise your hands on this, but you're very adept and very skilled, perhaps as machinists, tool and die. How many of you are chemists, maybe? How many of you have thought about creating uh, a mentorship? I'd like to use the other side's words with regard to this. Uh, a mentorship in which we create apprentices. Each one of you would be more ser would serve us better as instructors in the tool trades than as battlefield soldiers. You are irreplaceable and priceless. We made a comment regarding uh, one of the uh, government butcher people, Waco, and the uh, Randy Weaver case that we stood by and did nothing. The bottom line is here, when this happens again, and I'm sure it will, and they can take people individually because we will not have the ability to easily stop them, what would you recommend we do the next time they pull something like this? And then, when we could have some things we could do, would that not be the line that's drawn that finally sets this off? Reaction to what might happen with another Waco, and personally I will say this, I believe there will be five to seven other Wacos. Simultaneously, these actions will be more heavily defined and they will be more efficient. There will be no public news crews there. What they will do is they will execute the action with their own media control and their own cameras. If we kick the snot out of them and they lose, you will never hear about it. If they are victorious, they will use the propaganda at their discretion to improve their standing. Now, the militias have a bit of a problem, but it's not that difficult to understand. Communications is, is, the, first, is the first consideration. I challenge this is going to challenge that this is going to have to be done. We are going to have to surrender the electronic battlefield and leave it. The reason I say that is because we do not have all the technology initially. There are only two ways you can fight an EWU war, uh, an electronic warfare situation: either flood the battlefield with everything you can get your hands on, which is an option, by the way. In other words, everybody here could have transmitters and, and, and rated microwave transmitters, etc. Simple units that do nothing, but they clutter the field literally make most electronic warfare equipment or electronic countermeasures useless. The other option, which is far more terrifying to the other side, is utter silence. We shut everything down and work with standard operating procedures. They will choose who they attack, and we will certainly then have to choose how to fight them when that happens. For most of us who are in co-militia co units, or know of different units that exist, the policy is going to have to be to hold. Unlike the actions of the past, though, the defenders are going to have to be prepared to be offensive if they are pinned down and are supported. And during the action that takes place, the defenders will have to strike while the militia supporting units are showing up. This is Lexington and Concord all over again. We'll have to decide individually when we see the smoke as to what will have to be done in our local area. I believe, as I said, though, there'll be more than one, and it's not accidental. They have regionally compartmentalized our... our uh, our media. I've heard things in, in uh, the Carolinas in one day that I've never seen in the news in Michigan. And I'm sure you've all done this too, been all over the country. Things you've never even knew existed all of a sudden pop out at you on the news screen. Now organization with communications, anything and everything that will put a radio wave out should be retained. Cheaper is better. Quantity is more important even than, than, than the average quality item. You know, in other words, better to have 10 than 1. Better to have 20 than 10. This way, when you drop it, if you have to leave it or if you have to destroy it, you don't cry. I give you an example, a lot of people are buying night vision. Better to buy a lesser state-of-the-art piece, you know, one of, the, one of the less expensive items that you can go, ah, I don't care about this now, I've got to lighten my load, as opposed to spending four or five or six thousand dollars on something that you'll be cherishing more than perhaps life itself because it costs you so much. Don't worry, when you take down a black helicopter, everything will be there that you need. <laughs> regarding food warning because I think it might be important for people to know what they have in their home that could generate somebody entering your home because I know the executive order, I think it's 11490, said that the police could come into your home without warrant and they suspected you of hoarding food. With regard to the food hoarding laws, and this has been asked extensively, we have several packets of information that were generated, but the most recent come out of the executive orders that were just signed. There were three of them. One directive, or directive 25, for the most part is classified, but the first two specifically give authority to the different bureaucracies with regard to managing us from top to bottom, from food to gasoline to what your children will do, right on down the line. And food hoarding is one of the things that is discussed, or, well, of course, the, the fact that we're 
inappropriately stirring vast amounts of reserve, reserves or resources that should be in the hands of the government, not the people. <coughs> What I can recommend is this, you best buy all the food that you can get your hands on that's reasonably priced. You don't have to go out and necessarily buy a big food package. A lot of people have lived off rice and beans for a heck of a long time on this planet, and you can too. Better to have a lot of something than a little of something. The more you have, the more likely it is you not only can feed yourself, but we plan on taking care of each other. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do what, but presently they're trying to make illegal, of course. Everything we do will be illegal, so that shouldn't surprise any of you, of course. <laughs> but food storage is very, very important because everybody, everybody has heard the adage, an army travels on its stomach. Well, so does the rest of the nation. And we're going to be desperately in need of having you farmers that are here today do what you do best, keep planting. Those of you who are ranchers, keep, keep, keep reproducing cows. Pigs, sheep, goats, cats, dogs, I'll eat anything as long as it's still okay? Anybody who's familiar with it knows a dog doesn't taste all that bad. <laughs> and these are some of the healthiest dogs on the planet, by the way, aren't they? <laughs> Fluffy, I love you, but your taste is still in the pot. <laughs> oh, I know. I have a lot of dogs, so don't think I don't love dogs. <laughs> cats, well, that's another story. <laughs> I love cats too. Stir fry. <laughs> Anybody here old enough to remember what they used to call alley cat? Depression chicken? <laughs> Happened before in this country, it's going to happen again. Preferably keep the cats around, we've got to keep the roads down. Diced rats not so bad either. So. With that in mind, though any food reserves are better than no food reserves, most assuredly what we do will be, in some way, shape, or form, deemed illegal. Uh, we've all heard about the case, and we're trying to get more information on it. The gentleman who was uh, an FFL dealer in Dallas, Texas, and it's in the article here, we're going to try and contact these people, um, who have, of course, they inspected his FFL, they went through his records, they checked his weapons, everything was clean, and then they turned and looked at the MREs that he had in the store and said, who are those for? You know, because they had it in the back room, apparently. He said, oh, those are for me. Those aren't for sale. Oh, snap. They hit him for food hoarding. Under what authority? We don't know, but we can imagine, because we do know that there are guidelines and that the laws are in place. Some of you are familiar with the Department of Natural Resources in your states. And that if they suspect that food is in your house that shouldn't be there, you know, a la range cow, you know what that is, the antlers, if any range cow is suspected in your refrigerator, then they can apparently or supposedly go into your house without warrant. That's the way it's written in Michigan. Well, nobody's tried it in my home yet, and I don't really suggest that they try. My freezer is not locked, it's simply well guarded with Smith & Wesson in a 12 gauge. <laughs> so, there is going to be an attempt to try and account for it. I think I'll remind you of a few ads you may have already seen out here that we've seen in the Midwest. AT&T. Imagine being able to go through your grocery store without having to stop and having all of your groceries run up in one sweep. Well, how do you suppose they did that? And why do you think they're throwing that advertisement out there? CNN and a couple of other programs a little while ago did a little piece on microchips in the food boxes. Did anybody see that? No. Some people did. Thank you. See, again, you have numbers here, so it counts. It looks like a little piece of gray licorice. They're putting it on the cardboard boxes. My wife works with a grocery, a grocery chain, and strangely enough, General Mills got a special cut in their food prices, separate from everybody else. Who do you think got the chance to put the microchip in first? General Mills. They're the ones who brought you that nice little package we had around the Kix boxes with the regional governments of America. That's no accident. So what they're going to do is try to chip some of the food in the future, or chip the containers. They can't do it to the food, they're going to do it to the product container itself. I would highly recommend you repackage things if at all possible. Also, we're willing to pay a bounty for the first people who pick up the chips because they were already made. The company that got them bought every chip that was made to date. And they are employing them in the test programs already. So you may actually have some of this in your home and don't even know it. When you unpackage a box of cereal, break open the box and look on the inside. They're attached by nothing more than a small 